God is good all the time. My father, before I speak, you present a lot to me. And I pray, Lord God, that you are pleased in the way that I presented because I am, for a short period of time, Lord God, your mouthpiece. May you be pleased, Lord God, for how you show me I want to talk to them and present to them and teach them that same way, Lord God. I pray may your Holy Spirit use me as your vessel, Lord God. Pour your knowledge into me. Even though, Lord God, I fall short, but nonetheless, Lord God, I pray. May you, Lord God, not look at my shortcomings, but, Lord God, may you see your Son, Jesus Christ, that have washed me with his blood and your Holy Spirit working through me so that your people could be edified and full and they could further understand what they need to do, Lord God, what you are instructing them. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, again, begin to apply these things and begin to strengthen their relationship with you. We thank you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Without any hesitation, let me first um, say that um, last Sunday I had the opportunity to talk to all of you on the eighth concept that I wanted everyone to understand in Hebrews chapter 10, which is spur one another with the main purpose of helping others to remain strong in Christ and redirecting their mindset and even their action toward love and good deed. By giving them that nudge we indicated last Sunday, that we are helping them to see God's love for them through the natural. They will see the benefit of God's love or of us nudging them, and they will in return nudge another and so on and so forth. And the Bible declare in Hebrews chapter 10 that we should ought to do that until the day that Jesus Christ come back. The reason that it is so crucial and is so important is because the Lord know this life is full of difficulties and challenges. And sometimes these difficulties and challenges, they come and they cause us to lose focus. And we need to be redirected. Um, we need to be nudged so that we can refocus on Christ. And it is important that we continue to spur one another. Today I want to wrap up the sermon with this ninth concept, ninth and last concept, at least for this sermon. But Hebrew chapter 10 have a lot of things that you can learn. But at least for this sermon, the ninth and last thing that I would want you to know is, um, um, can be found in the first part of verse 25. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, if we look at the first part. And the first part of that verse says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us know that for whatever reason, some of the members of the first church started to give up on meeting together for whatever the reason may be. Maybe they, their focus have turned back to the troubles of life and they see that they need to work and I have no time to come together and fellowship with other believers. Um, maybe it was family issues, I don't know. But whatever the issue may be, the Bible indicates to us in verse 25 that some of the church members started to give up in meeting together. 
This morning, this is the ninth concept. Do not, I repeat, do not give up on meeting together. Do not give up on meeting together. I don't know if some saw it as a routine and uh, they've been meeting together in the temple courts uh, every day and they eat together and they discuss and did Bible study and they saw, well, it's a routine and then they stopped coming. I, this morning I'm here to tell you that do not be like these members in the first church that is described in the book of Acts and they give up of meeting together. The ninth concept is do not give up meeting together. Don't stop, don't slack off, don't take lightly the benefits of being around other believers. Don't take this lightly at all. I'm going to say a few things that's going to cause you to think, or, you, or some people may call it a little controversial. Listen and listen carefully. There is power in meeting together. Nous get puissance le nou vini ensemble. There is more power when all of us are in unity. We are united. Li get plus puissance la unité not nous même. Because we meet together that does not mean that we are united. There's benefits in being, meaning together, and there's even more benefits in being united. Um, this morning, I'm going to talk about the benefits of being together. In unity, I'll probably leave that for another time, because there's a lot of things that the Holy Spirit can do when our mindset is united. When our heart and desires are united, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, in fact, a, a sample of that, you will find that in Genesis, the Tower of Babel. When people were together, they came together and um, they got the mindset or the strategy of, of let's build up a tower that reaches up to God. But this was not God's instructions to mankind. God's instruction is to spread out throughout the earth. Not stay one place, but spread out and multiply. Because I give you the earth to dominate. That's what Genesis says. Not to stay in one place. But everybody wanted to stay in one place and build a big tower so that they can reach up high to God. And that's how they could be closer to God. See, some people think by doing things like that, this is how you're going to be closer to God. You know, activities, if, 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 if I participate in a choir, it will get me to be closer to God. Uh, 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 if I participate in uh, uh, um, cleaning the church or, or, or whatever activity, youth meeting. Uh, I'm in the choir, so I'm, I'm getting closer to God. And people don't understand that it's not activities that get you closer to God. It's obedience that gets you closer to God. Le obéi bon Dieu, qu'on a relation avec bon Dieu, vini plus fort. It's obedience. God didn't say build a tower. God said Spread. Throughout the whole entire earth. <laughs> and the gen book of Genesis says, uh, God realized how powerful it is when men come together. Uh, there's not nothing that they cannot do when they come together. How powerful they are. So God says, listen, uh, I, I can't allow men to build a tower because that's not my will. 
And you, everybody should know that God will supersedes everything. Supersedes everything. So he says, I'm going to bring a division. A division of languages. So that they don't understand each other. And everybody that understands their language will be together. And they start moving throughout the earth. You see, now you're obeying. So all the Spanish-speaking people came together. And they start moving to another place of the earth. All the French-speaking people come together. All the Latin Greek came together. And they start spreading throughout the earth. Obedience is the key. It's not activities, but it's obedience. There's power when we come together. And I want you to realize that. Now... Here's the controversial statement, and it should not be controversial if you really understand the word of God. Listen, even if that a group of people is not completely united, they still should not give up meeting together. Even if we are not completely united, we should not give up meeting together. It should not be controversial. Let's see if I could put it in an easier, or give an easier example. If a family members don't see eye to eye, what would you suggest they do? Separate or keep on meeting together? What's your suggestion? What's your answer? So why would it be different for the church of God? Even if unity is not completely there yet, we should not stop meeting together. There's benefits in meeting together. Now, let's add a little bit more information. You're going to hear those two words, meeting together. And unfortunately, because we are in a pandemic, I had to clarify this statement, unfortunately. Now, fortunately though, because of technology, meeting together it does not have only one meeting. It's not only physical that we can come and meet together. We can meet together through electronic devices. We can meet together through phone. We can meet together through uh, um, Zoom or any sort of application such as that. Um, posting statement on Facebook or any other sorts of social media. I personally would not call that mean together. Mean together is more two people talking and conversating or even more people talking and conversating. But posting little statements, I don't call that meeting together. But through Zoom, through the phone, we should not give up meeting together. If you are outside and you can stay six feet from each other, uh, well, don't stop meeting together. Now, I explain all these other ways that we can meet together, but I truly believe the best way that we can continue to meet together is in person. I'm sorry. I love technology. But in person is the best way. But because of the pandemic, at least for now, if we can't meet in person, let's continue to meet together in other ways as well. Another point I want to clarify, the controversial statement. What makes it controversial? Because it kind of sounds like you saying, Brother Fronts, that I, needed to, I need to be fake. If I'm not united with somebody, then I shouldn't be with that person. If I am, then I'm being fake. So Brother Funts, are you asking me to be fake? And my answer to that question is no. I am not asking you to be fake. But I want you to realize something. That when you meet together, even though there's no unity now, unity will be formed. 
Why do you think of this statement? A family that prays together stays together. It's not just that they prayed, which is a beautiful thing together. A beautiful thing. But they doing that together. And eventually, unity will be formed among them. Where am I getting this stuff? Well, when you have a chance, for now, just write this down. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Read it at home. Where is Brother Funz getting this? We keep coming together and unity develop? Yes, unity developed when we keep coming together. There's benefits. Ah, let's give you some more information on this before I start talking about these benefits of coming together. Number one, I want you to understand that God created us to be influenced and to influence others. This is not a statement you heard for the first time, if you know me. Uh, okay, you, God created us to be influenced by others and for us to influence others, which mean what? Uh, which mean who we have around us matters. Our success in anything that we do is mostly determined by who is around us. And the reason that I say mostly is because ultimately God determined your success. Are you with me? But the people around you mostly determine your success in any angle, occupational-wise, educational-wise, financial-wise, mental-wise, natural-wise, or even spiritual-wise. Those, those who are around you will determine your success. Why? Because we are created to be influenced by others that are around us. My question to all of you, this is a rhetorical question. Ask yourself that question and then answer it for yourself. Who do you listen to? Who got your ears? Who got your ears? Because whoever that got your ears will have a doorway to your mind. And your mind will control your actions. Are you with me so far? I want you to understand that because this is why it's important for us to continue to meet one another and to be around believers. Be around those that are serious in serving God. Those that are godly. Those that are seeking to please the Lord. Those that are seeking to do the will of God. Those that have the fear of God. It is important to be around these people because these people are going to influence you. Kunia. I will see if I could uh, um, explain that in Creole too as well. I don't know how many people watch natural, um, not natural, um, National Geographics. Um, and they display nature. And they explain, um, they show a buffalo, buffaloes. Buffaloes are big muscular animals with two big horns and they're very aggressive. And then they will show lions chasing after the buffalo. Once the lions are chasing after the buffalo, well, what usually happens, because lions are very sneaky, they, they, they will crawl, crawl, until they get close to the animal, and then suddenly pop out. You see, that's their technique. Because they know when they suddenly pop out, they scare the buffalo or any animal, and then the animals start to do and run all sorts of different ways without thinking. But eventually when the buffalo 
or the fear in the buffalo calm down, the buffalo now begin to think logically. That's why I love to watch animals. Uh, <laughs> animals, uh, I really do. It, it, you can learn from them. Okay, you really can learn. They start to think logically. And instead of running all over the place, now you start to see the buffaloes coming together. All of the adults, the strong ones, they stay outside. They form a circle. And they stay in the outer layer of the circle. All the babies stay in the middle of the circle. The reason that the babies stay in the middle of the circle, because the lion is after who? The big animals or the babies? Uh, let's switch there. I, I, if you can put one and one together already as I'm explaining this, because there's a spiritual meaning behind it, that would be very helpful. So all of the animals, strong animals, they form a, a, a circle. The big muscular adults, they, 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 they stay outside of the circles. All the babies stays inside of the circle. And now when the lion wants to attack the buffalo, the big adults handle and, t and fight against the lions. And the lions know once the buffaloes come together, they start to think logically. The fear comes down. Now the buffalo can fight against the lion. You know, I was always taught in kindergarten, young people, that lion is the king of jungle. Uh, when, you watch, when you watch animals shows, there's a lot of animals that can take up a lion. And the buffalo is no joke. They will fight with the animal until death. And they will protect the young that's in the middle, no matter what. You see, Satan understands and knows when we get together, <laughs> hallelujah, the one that are in greater faith, the one that's more experienced with God, the one that know more Bible doctrines and principles and, and concepts, they are the one that's going to talk to those that are weaker in faith, weaker in knowledge, weaker in experience. And when they talk to those that are weaker in knowledge, those that are weaker in knowledge gain knowledge. Those that are weaker in faith gain faith. Those that are weaker in experience gain experience. In other words, the baby that's in the middle begin to grow up. Now there's more adults buffalo. And the more adults buffalo that they have, the more that they could take up the lion. The Bible describes Satan as what? Well, there's a lot of things that the Bible describes Satan. Liar, deception, a tricker, a trickster. But the Bible used the analogy of lion to say that Satan, that Satan is tricky and he's going to look for those that are weaker among us. But when we come together, those that are weak become stronger and they're able to fight against the lion. Satan knows that. And that's why he wants to, you know why he wants to do? He wants to sneak, 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 and then pop up. Because when he pop up, he cause division among the buffalo. He wants to get you alone. He wants you to be by yourself. He wants you to think that nobody can help you or understand what you're going through. And when he, once he gets you alone, now he can defeat you. But when you are with other fellow believers, hallelujah. I thank God. I thank God. I will encourage you today. <laughs> Uh, today, now it seems like young people listening to their parents seem like to be a rare thing. Uh, there are a lot of young people don't want to listen to their parents. And I thank God that I had parents that told me, 
Listen, I'm going to introduce you to not people of your age, but people that are older than you. I'm going to introduce you to believers that are experienced. And I'm going to have you talk to them, and they will talk to you so that you can understand the gospel even more. And I didn't rebel against my mother when she said that. And when she introduced me to sisters in the church and brothers in the church, I began to ask them questions. And this is a question I will stress to all young people today before I leave. Listen and listen carefully. Do a pre-med student go to a doctor that work in a hospital and tell the doctor, you know what? I don't think I can talk to you or ask you any question because you can't relate to me. You're already a doctor. You already work in a hospital. But I can't ask you any question because you made it already. Do a pre-med student, do they think that way? An engineer student, do they go to engineers and say, I can't talk to you. You made it already. You're already an engineer. You can't relate to me. You cannot understand me. You can't. Because you already made it. No, they don't. A pre-med student, if he or she is wise, they will pick the brain of those that are doctors already. Ask them a bunch of questions. How did you make it? What class did you take? What scholarship did you sign up for? What school did you go to? What experience did you take? How did you make it? So why do we have young people that think those that are godly or those that are ministers, I can't talk to them because they are too godly. They won't understand me. They already made it. I'm here to tell all young people, this is a tactic that Satan is putting in your mind to cause a division. You are not supposed to be divided from those that are stronger you are supposed to be united. And that's how you become stronger. Pick the brain of those that are more godly. First of all, understand that nobody has make it. Nobody is perfect. We all are under construction. Maybe I don't have the same weakness that you have. Maybe I know the Bible a little bit more than you do. Maybe I've been running the Christian race before you do. But that does not mean that I am perfect. Sir. I'm still under the construction of the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two, what you ought to do is prick the brain. How did you know that you are called? How did you make the decision to be a Christian? How do you stay obedient? How do you overcome the sin of temptation? How do you know that God has called you to marry that person? How did you know? How, how did you understand the scriptures? These are the type of questions that those that are in weaker in faith should ask. But instead of that, you know what they say? They say that these people, they made it already. They can't understand. They don't know what I'm going through. They've been tempted. They don't know. Young people, I'm here to tell you, clear cut. Because as I developed this sermon, this came into my mind and it came strong. There are people that are listening to me right now that think that people cannot relate to them. I don't know who it may be. Maybe their parents. Maybe it's a preacher. Maybe it's a youth leader. Maybe I don't know who you think that people cannot relate to you. Listen, you're not the first one to be tempted by a boyfriend. You're not the first one to be tempted by a girlfriend. You're not the first one to be tempted by sex. 
You're not the first one to be tempted to leave God. You're not the first one to be tempted to get discouraged. You're not the first one to be tempted to not follow God's will. Don't ever think that you are by yourself. This is Satan technique. Pick the brain of those that are more godly so that you can be more stronger and we all can fight Satan together. May God bless you.